Hey everyone, this is the Energia Podcast. I'm Dr. G and my guest today is Dr. Carl Moore. Carl is a professor of strategy and organization at the Dessortel School of Management at McGill University, where he's been working for over 20 years and where he di- directs the Advanced Leadership Program alongside Henry Mintzberg. Prior to that, Carl was on the faculty at Oxford University, where he taught executive education. He received his PhD in strategy and leadership from York University. And prior to that, he cut his teeth as a senior corporate manager in a number of prominent organizations, including IBM and Hitachi. Carl has published dozens of academic and executive journal articles, including for the Academy of Management, Human Relations, and World Business, and has also appeared in numerous books and edited volumes, in addition to authoring or co-authoring several books of his own. And Carl also continues to deliver seminars at multiple business schools across the world. He has also served as a consultant to numerous leading global firms, including HP, Accenture, Pfizer, Lufthansa, British Airways, IBM, HP, Shell, Volvo, and Air Canada. He is a regular contributor to Forbes and the Globe and Mail, and has also appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, The National Post, The Financial Times, and other leading press publications, as well as having appeared on the likes of CNN, BBC, and CTV. And Carl also hosts a regular radio series called the CEO Series, in which he conducts interviews with senior leaders from some of the world's preeminent business organizations, as well as other prominent thought leaders. And he has conducted over 3,500 interviews in his time with Richard Branson, Justin Trudeau, Susan Cain, and Muhammad Yunus, being just a small sample of the many luminaries he's dialogued with. So with that extremely condensed version of your much more massive bio out of the way, Carl, thanks for joining me today. Gareth, great to see you again. I remember working with you in Montreal some years ago and uh, connecting in the last year uh, in your time in Vietnam and doing some interesting work together. Yeah, it's been great. It's been a great great ride together with you, Carl. And yeah, I mean, as you said, we we, we met, uh, I make it about nine years ago at McGill in Belmont-Royal. Uh, during what I recall, and perhaps this is just my my unacclimated Kiwi self speaking here, but during what I, what I recall was a particularly gnarly winter, even by Montreal's already gnarly winter standards. Uh, but for those of us who who have not had uh, the good fortune to get to know you over the years, as as I have done, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your professorial background and what you currently do and historically have done inside and outside of the academy? Well, I got started uh, after my career at IBM, spent about a dozen years with them, did my PhD in Toronto at uh, the Schulich School and the Rotman School, and then um, decided to go over to England. And so I spent five years at Oxford uh, on the faculty full-time, taught there, some at Cambridge and LBS as well. And then our son, F.A., came home at age four and said, Dottie, I need a bath. And we realized that our, our kids were becoming Brits. And my wife's from Quebec City, I'm from Toronto. So we decided to come back home to Canada. And I had got to know Henry during my PhD, did a year as a visiting assistant prof here and talked to him and uh, also recruited MIT and Dartmouth and various places in the States, but decided that we wanted to come back home to Canada and work with one of the world's great people. And so that's how I ended up back here at McGill and have run various programs with him over a number of years. and. Uh, enjoyed that, learned a lot from him, and um, took some of my own ideas out into the bigger world. Amazing. So, I mean, one one of the most striking things about watching your career evolve um, is it always seems like you're involved in like 50 things at one time. And I mean, you know, you, you, you mentioned Mintzberg, who's you know, really top of the food chain when it comes to, to strategy and, and, and thinking and management. But I mean, uh, you're, you're always meeting this absolute who's who list of business leaders and government leaders and culture leaders and thought leaders. And so uh, just off the bat, I wonder what it's like just getting to sit there and pick the brains of the people you get to speak with. I mean, I'm sure it's always incredibly illuminating and insightful and everything, but is there also an element of, you know, I can't believe I get to have this conversation with this person and and get paid for it? Well, I don't get paid by Bell Media or those things, but I get paid for by, by McGill, so that's a fair point. I mean, interesting, uh, I talked to, uh, but the Olympics are on now, uh, this time of year, and 
sat down with Dick Pound, who went to the Olympics in the 1960s and was the is the longest serving Olympic Committee member, ran for the presidency. So we talked about, you know, Moscow and L.A. and various things where, you know, people thought about should we boycott it and then sat down with Kim St. Pierre, who McGill alumni had three gold medals playing uh, for the hockey, the women's hockey team for Canada. And then Greg Bunton is a McGill NBA. So it's, you know, people like that are just exciting to talk about the Olympics. People have been there and done it. But, you know, I talked to Mohammed Yunus last week. Um, the guy who was the CEO of British Airways in Iberia is now the CEO of IATA, the International uh, Air Transport Association, headquartered in Geneva, in Montreal. So it's something where you just get to talk to really interesting people and ask them within reason almost anything you want. And one of the things I do is different, is that I don't ask CEOs about their share price or the latest issues of wrestling with so much as stepping back and thinking about where they've come from but what are they wrestling with as leaders? You know, not things about, you know, your, one of your clients has walked away, but how do you lead Generation Z? How do you work with middle managers? What are you doing in terms of the pandemic? Is again, you know, been a huge topic for the last two years. Uh, and then one a book I'm writing for Stanford is on introverts, ambiverts, and extroverts. So I would get the chance to ask them whether they're more introverted, ambiverted, or extroverted. And that's an interesting conversation where two, Generals I've talked to, one is uh, four-star general um, Stanley McChrystal, big name out of the U.S., and then the head of the Canadian military that came to class last week, and both turned out to be big introverts. And so they reckon, but they're, you know, four-star generals. They're among the most senior military people in the world. So they have to act a bit like an extrovert. But it's fun to talk to people like that and get it. I talked to uh, Lewis Hamilton, the F1 driver, about being an introvert or expert for 15 minutes just through, you know, some doors opening up. Uh, will I am? So, you know, interesting set of people I get to talk to and discuss some of the research things I'm thinking about. Most are CEOs, but other ones like Lewis Hamilton's not a CEO, but it's interesting to ask him one of the big names in the sports world what is more introvert or extrovert. So it's, it's just, you can, at times you pinch yourself the kind of people you get to talk to. But... Uh, It's interesting, through pure luck, I mean, Justin Trudeau went to McGill, graduated just before I got here, got to know him, uh, interviewed Mohammed Yunus, comes to Montreal every every year or two, and uh, Sir Richard Branson, I knew in England, but came here. And what I recognized, through pure luck, I, I had interviewed those three, but you go to someone, I've interviewed Justin Trudeau, coolest politician on earth. Mohammed Yunus, Nobel Peace Prize winner, Sir Richard Branson, and I would never say, and who are you? But it's generally implied, and you don't outrank those three unless you have the in your title, the Pope, the Queen, the President, which, you know, other than those three, you know, you go, hey, this is a club I'd like to be a member of. I didn't realize that until I, through just luck, had got those three, but it opens doors now. Yeah, I can only imagine. I mean, you're certainly not the average rabbit when it comes to, to management professors in terms of the eclectic range of people you get to interview. I mean, you just mentioned, you know, the likes of Lewis Hamilton being able to get, you know, like his thoughts on something like introversion, extroversion. That really is something qualitatively different to what you see in a typical um, management interview. And I mean, of all the these many people that you've interviewed or dialogued with, I mean, what what are some particularly, you, you've alluded to a couple already, but what are some particularly notable insights or perspectives from, that you've heard from these people that really gave you pause yourself? Things that maybe upended your thinking or shifted your perspective on some particular topic? Well, part of it is that the idea that a number of them, a large number are introverts. But it's a matter of, of part of the saying is that The strengths of some introverts is something I want as an extrovert. So it's kind of, you know, turning around and saying, look at, and I give a talk where I talk about, I've interviewed, you know, CEOs and looked at leaders for probably 25, 30 years. The last 10 years, I've looked at three groups that typically in the past we ignored and overlooked. So one is, um, you know, Generation Z, they're young, but it's something where interesting leaders there. Another one is Indigenous leaders where I do a bi-weekly column for the Globe and Mail, been doing it for about a year and a half now with an Indigenous graduate student, where we interview Indigenous leaders. And part of that thought is saying, for centuries, white men, and it's been almost entirely men, have lectured Indigenous people how to live 
and they've done this in New Zealand and Australia as well, and your your bits of the world. Uh, and Vietnam has a lot of indigenous people as well. Where the idea is that saying we've lectured them, let's turn the table and listen to them for a change. And what do they have to teach us? It got started when I uh, co-taught with a guy named Paul Tellier, who was the clerk of the Privy Council, the, the person who runs the government on behalf of the Prime Minister. He then became CEO of CN, 24,000 people, uh, Canadian National Railroads, and Bombardier, which at the time was about 70,000 people, Canada's biggest, most global company. So I had uh, breakfast with Paul at a restaurant on our street called Shea Nicks. And um, I said, Paul, Business is always lecturing government to be more businesslike. Let's let's just turn the tables and say, what can government teach business? And so that was an interesting conversation. We wrote up some articles from it. It was well received. And you know, here's a guy who ran the government and ran our biggest company, where it's kind of you know like you think you got to listen to him, and and he made some great points. In the same way, indigenous people are teaching me about leadership and how to live in a way that has been almost entirely overlooked in Canada, and I think much of the rest of the world as well. So it's something where, um, I, about 10 years ago, I did a thing where I followed around senior women executives for a day, one-on-one. -on -one. And at the end of the day, every one of the women spent about a half hour lecturing me about how tough it was. And it's something where, you know, the world's gone on since then. There's a lot more women executives and board members and so on. But it was something where, I'm just looking for people who've been kind of neglected in the conversation to say, what can we learn from them and what do they bring to the conversation, whether it's introverts, whether it's indigenous people, you know, not so much women as it used to be, but they were certainly 10 years ago was more neglected than today. And also Generation Z, where we tend to neglect the young people, but bring them up into the conversation. So that's part of what I do is, I'm not entirely sure why, but... Uh, look for people who have been neglected in the conversation and bring them more to the front and center and learn from them. That's fantastic. And, 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 and actually very, very important work in so many ways. And we'll, we'll come back, we'll circle back to a couple of those um, specific topic areas. But first, I just wanted to um, just get, get your thoughts on, you get to travel a lot in what you do. I mean, it always seems like you're, you're gallivanting here, there and everywhere to, to give talks and seminars and so forth. And so, What's that experience like for you of getting to speak at so many different business schools and interact with MBA students and the like? And, and, and maybe what are the most notable differences you see um, in business cultures, uh, in business schools, sorry, uh, in MBA programs and the like um, from culture to culture? Well, the last two years, it's been uh, more done remotely. Like I gave a talk to uh, business school in Ecuador last week. I taught on SSA Qatar on Monday, gave a talk to McGill, uh, retired people yesterday, then this morning got up uh, all too early to talk, give a talk in an Indian uh, Amity uh, University in India, and then I'm off to uh, Singapore tomorrow. So there's an opportunity, doing it by Zoom, you don't get the same sense of connection with people, but yeah, for a number of years I've taught around the world and MBA programs, there's some similar DNA where I've done sessions at Stanford every year. I've done them at Harvard and Oxford, Cambridge, INSEAD, IMD, and so on. But again, it's interesting when I went to Skolkova in Moscow, that was a bit different culture or teaching at um, Renmin University in Beijing. There's a similar MBA culture around the world to some degree. There's the kind of people who get into MBAs, and because you know Harvard has an influence around the world over the years, and uh, Stanford and so on, but there is still cultural differences in terms of the the way you do conversations, the respect for older people, for hierarchy, and so are some of the things that come across. And, and in some ways, I have three personalities. I'm not being treated for this, Gareth, but when I go to England, I have a British accent. I'm quieter and more sarcastic. I myself in Canada and the US, which I lived six years, in England five, in New York particularly, I, I, and my students find this hard to believe, I turn up the volume because I'm in New York and it's something where everybody's trying to make noise and to a large degree, though uh, Susan Cain, who I work with, who wrote the book Quiet, a huge introvert, is from New York. So there are native New Yorkers like her, Susan that are introverted as well, but it's a noisier culture. So I adjust my personality to some degree, at least in those three countries, which are pretty similar, to, you know, to be honest, but I've lived a long time in all three, so I can kind of adjust 
I want to go to France because I, I taught at Ecole Nationale Pont de Chaussée and kind of adjusted a bit there in Holland. I taught at Rotterdam School of Management quite a few times. So you kind of, you know, say there are some cultural differences, but in some ways it's amazing how MBA programs have some similar DNA to a considerable degree around the world because of what they're teaching, where their students want to go, and where the fact they've been trained. There, there's some things that overlap for sure. Yeah, I can imagine the similarities between the programs in terms of what they actually teach, like what's stru- how they're structurally, the, 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 how the pedagogy is structured and so forth. I'd imagine much of that is the same, but those similarities also expose the stark cultural differences that you were just mentioning between some of these places as well. I'd imagine it illuminates um, a lot of them. So, um, I mean, you, you, you just mentioned remote working and how much you've had to do this through zoom lately and it's, it's put a dampener on your otherwise um uh jet setting um lifestyle as a, as a management speaker um but just taking it into the the covert space for a moment like pe- perhaps setting aside some of the obvious impacts that COVID has had on the world of business stuff like remote working the reduction on travel and, and so forth what is your general sense of just how much COVID has upended the world of business, perhaps the philosophy of business based on based on your own thoughts and just also what you've gleaned speaking to as many business leaders uh, as you do. I've talked about 100 CEOs since the pandemic because I have a CEO radio show every week and then I have a CEO class. So a lot of his issues, you know, they all wrestle with is kind of the working from home phenomena. Um, how much are we going to get back to business travel? How much do we have to have people there? And again, the CEOs tend to be, other than startups, older, and they would tend to go with the tradition of wanting to be in the same room, wanting to schmooze people, wanting to work the room, wanting to be there. And I think they're considerably right that you need to get out there to get new business. And, you know, when I talk to, I do some, I teach it with a BCG partner, I do a bit of research with McKinsey. Uh, Existing business you keep going, but new business, there's a sense you've got to go explore and get a sense for them that you can't get over Zoom or Teams or whatever. Um, the younger generation who tend not to live close to work because, you know, they can't afford to, are more excited about working remotely, uh, particularly if you, if you have small kids, both, you know, mom and dad working. It just makes a very complex life that not having to spend an hour to get downtown and back makes life a lot easier. And, and a lot of people want to live in other parts of the world for a while or, you know, more remote parts of, in our case, Canada. So th- there are some of those things that are going to happen, but I think we're still going to return to work to a fair degree and we need that human interaction. Now, I say there's a very much an extrovert missing human contact and having coffee now, back to having coffee with my students, uh, one-on-one or in groups, getting on a plane to Singapore tomorrow. So it's something where... I really miss that, and it's true for extroverts, I think it's true for business in general, but I think we're going to be substantially different than we were before the pandemic over the next five or ten years from talking to a lot of CEOs about it. Yeah, and look, I mean, th- this um, that just segues us into what I was, was going to ask next. I mean, about, I mean, for me as an introvert, um, the last couple of years have almost been, you know, w- w- without trivializing the 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 awful impact of the pandemic and everything from a purely selfish point of view the last couple of years for people like me in many respects have been great we've been able to sequester ourselves away in our home offices and just do what we do and um you know we haven't had the obligation to get out and and be amongst people and yet i have just returned to in-person teaching this week um and as an introvert i don't think i quite appreciated how much i missed that sustained social interaction so actually now being back among my students and and everything um has actually been very very good good for me i think it's actually going to be very very good for my growth and development not just as a teacher but as a person after after doing everything um on zoom these you know the last um few years um and so just 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 circling back to the, this the work you've done around introversion and extroversion and leadership and you know you've, you've been one of the most prominent voices in advocating for the you know the unique value that introvert leaders bring to the party in business so just to to just to break down what you've learned along the way in this topic like what is the most impactful or game-changing or maybe even you know paradigm shifting thing 
that extroverts can learn from introverts and that introverts can learn from extroverts in, in the modern business landscape? Well, the title book I'm writing for Stanford is We're All Ambiverts Now. And so ambivert is a word I discovered in the literature back going back to the 20s an American psychologist, but has been largely overlooked. Uh, War, Adam Grant at Wharton with a couple of uh, HBS people did an article about 10 years ago looking at salespeople. So that's kind of the only article still in, until I've been writing some stuff on it. And when an ambivert is someone who can act like an introvert at times and an extrovert at other times, what I'm arguing is that this is something that executives have got to do if they want to be an executive. Now, you know, if your family owns the firm, you know, there may be some exceptions to that. But what it's saying is that David Benson runs all the big shoe company headquartered out of Montreal, thousand stores around the world. He's 6'8", 300 pounds. He's not overweight. He's just huge. He's CEO is the son of Aldo. So this is some everybody knows who he is. If he goes to a room and wants to talk about strategy, and he says what's on his mind, which he already knows what's on his mind, it kind of ends all conversation. People go, David, that's why your CEO would love it. And there's a sense of very positive response. But he's not learning anything. So as an extrovert, he's got to hold back and act like an introvert and be the listener. And then he goes around the room and they each give their opinion. He's connecting the dots in his minds. And the strategy he came in with and what he lives with is quite different. Now, the happy thought, he's CEO, so at the end he gets to decide the strategy, as he should. But it's something where he's got to act like an introvert in order to be effective. And it's interesting, there's a guy named Claude Mangeau who was the CEO of CN, about 24,000 people, big trade company uh, here in Canada, headquartered in Montreal. Huge introvert. And so he was COO, and the board was saying, maybe you'll be CEO. They gave him a coach who gave him a clicker like a bouncer has in a bar and said, five times a day, act like an extrovert to grow those skill sets. For example, he'd get in the elevator in the morning and he would say, you know, look at his feet as an introvert and save us 100,000 bucks in the elevator ride, which is very useful. But as CEO, he need to say, good morning, Gareth, recognize you, say your name, and then say something like, you know, hey, it's a cold day out there, something you're not gonna argue with, and then say, Gareth, you killed it last week in your presentation to the board, really appreciate your contribution and your hard work. So that's good CEO behavior that you need to do. And so both have got to act like the other. Now, ambiverts do it naturally. But what I say is that, look, at you are what you are. And there's some research at Harvard suggesting that it's somewhat hardwired from looking at four-month-old babies and following around for, uh, for many, many years, that it's somewhat hardwired. Therefore, what you need to do is be yourself. Be authentic. And that's one of the things we love to talk about in leadership these days, being authentic. But learn to act like the other because it's the right thing to do. Now, uh, around grade three, you lose your name as a parent. Because in grade three, your child's more important than you are. So you're no longer Gareth. You're Susan's dad. You know, and if you get upset about the rest of the parents, go, Gareth, grow up. You know, you're bigger than your daughter. You have more education. You make more money. Just everything in being cute, you win. But it's her the place where she is important, and that's great for her. So you act to you got to act like an introvert to be a good parent there. So it's something where it's not it's being an adult, and as an executive, you've got to step up and act like the other. But it can be exhausting when I act like an introvert. Yeah, I, can, I can imagine it's exhausting, but I also I've never found the idea that an introvert evolving in the direction or learning things from an extrovert or vice versa i never found that irreconcilable with the idea of authenticity i think try i think it's someone who's naturally you know quote hardwired as an introvert if they're able to adapt many of the attributes of an extrovert into their own repertoire that to me is just a more evolved version of their authentic self if they were copying an extrovert's exact behaviors wholesale and just imitating and mimicking them i think that would be quite different but i think the idea that a, that a natural introvert can you know pick up a few tools of the trade from an extrovert and, and factor them into their own repertoire yeah i, I i've just never seen that as ir irreconcilable with this idea of authentic leadership that you just mentioned that's a great point, and I'll probably uh, change what I say in the future, and I appreciate that, Gareth. Part of it is that when you act, an introvert acts like an extrovert, it's exhausting. Part of it, so what you have to do is take introvert breaks. And as an extrovert, I can act like an introvert, but then I take extrovert breaks. So 
What I do is, uh, it's interesting because in the literature there's a lot about introvert breaks, but I couldn't find anything about extrovert breaks. And I said, hey, that's not fair. How come they get breaks we don't? So I wrote an article for Wharton Leadership Digest about the five types of extrovert breaks I take. So for example, I'm writing a book ironically about introverts. I'm in my office for a couple hours up on the third floor of the Brofman building. After a couple hours, I can't take it anymore. Do you hear the pain in my voice, Gareth? So what I do is I go down to the second floor where there's an endless supply of undergrads. Admittedly, I'm giving grades to them. But what I do is chat with them. And they often will uh, tease me and go extrovert break. But I go and refill my batteries and come back to my office ready to, to write again. Uh, I mean, you you were mentioning before um, working with millennials and Gen Z, trying to understand uh, those younger generations and what they contribute uh, to the world of business. I mean, as a as a millennial New Zealander, and and at almost forty one, I'm a very elderly millennial now. Um, I can't help but refer to the line "OK Boomer," which I, I know I know you've used in your published work, and 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 which. Um, originated with a, a smart-ass New Zealand member of parliament. Um, um, w- w- when um, um, a, lo- a lot of the differences between Gen Z and, and, and um, older generations and millennials and older generations, th- thanks, of course, in part to, to your own work, a lot of these differences are now fairly obvious and, and, and well-documented in terms of uh, tech savvy, uh, younger generations wanting things like feedback immediately, bombardment with information at a level that previous generations weren't exposed to. Um, but I wonder if there's anything less immediately obvious or already well known about either Gen Z or my fellow millennials, which business leaders would be uh, wise to recognize and perhaps strategize around? Well, in my book, OK Boomers, it's with the publisher, so it should be out in the next month or two. What I'm arguing in a sentence is that people over 45 the university degree were taught a modern worldview. People under 35 with a university degree have been taught a postmodern worldview, therefore must be managed differently. And so what I do is uh, give a talk to McGill uh, retired professors yesterday, and so it was quite uh, amusing, reflected on what we teach at universities and the worldview we teach. So one is it's much less hierarchy. And when I explain it and say, look, think about when I went to a, a doctor as a kid. It was a man with a stethoscope. It was a you know a uniform on, and he uh, it was always a he back then had a uh, you know would be behind this huge desk you could land an aircraft on, and the, the hierarchy was huge. Where today, when I go to my doctor, I call her Doc, but I don't call her Doctor Rowan, and. I say to her, on the bus here, I googled what's wrong with me, and I have three theories. So it's something where there's much more, less, much less hierarchy, many more sources of truth and knowledge, and what truth is has evolved. And we see that in terms of social media and where people get news from these days. It really is different than it used to be. So those are some of the things that we recognize, but you've got to think about what does this mean for their view of working with their manager. And it's really, if you don't listen to Generation Z, you're a jerk. Because they just don't see us as being that much above them. Then when I was younger, I saw the people above me as you know just a huge difference in terms of their wisdom and knowledge. And to a certain degree, what is truth and knowledge genuinely has changed. That it's different than it used to be. That genuinely, there's just less truth than there used to be. I think there's still truth, but there's a lot less. And when you take on board and think about that, most people would agree with it, but you go, what are the implications for young people who just don't know difference? And that's what I think I'm trying to get older people to think about so that they reflect on, they go, yeah, I actually agree with that, but what are the implications for management and leadership? That's what I, I get at and, and natter on about. It's it's great. And I mean, I, I, I just thinking about, as you were speaking about this, um, the formality and the, the, the approach to seniority and, and so forth. And, um, you know, teaching here in Vietnam, I mean, my students bow to me on the way into the classroom. And, uh, you know, d- despite the number of times that I've said things like, you can call me Gareth, you can call me Mr. Craze, you know, you can call me Susan if it makes you happy, despite all my, <laughs> you know, all, 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 all my all my, my offers to them to speak to me in as casual a manner as possible, um, they speak to me in a very, very deferential sense. And, um, you know, so I, I, I wonder if 
these trends in among Gen Z and among millennials in the Western world, maybe they are going to happen at a later time um, in Confucian Asia. Maybe they're not going to happen in Confucian Asia. Do, do, do you have any thoughts about how maybe there's a, um, a cultural factor at play here in terms of how millennials and Gen Z respond um, and interface with, uh, with older generations? Well, there's a cultural overlay, and Miguel has an MBA in Tokyo, so I've taught there many times. And there's definitely a cultural overlay that, that matters. But the ideas of postmodern thought are very much being taught at leading, you know, all Japanese universities. I mean, I've taught this in Myanmar, uh, in Saudi Arabia, in other cultures. We think they might more apt to be kind of, you know, a bit behind things. But in universities around the world, we've been postmodern for years, and those thoughts have been out there uh, in terms of what we teach. So there is a cultural thing where in Japan, they're more hierarchical still. So it's changed, but I think sometimes Japanese culture don't realize that Japanese young people have changed more than we might think, and we just assume they're kind of acting, and they do act Japanese, but they may not have entirely um, as Japanese as some of the older Japanese people think. Right, and just to um, take this now back into the the indigenous research space, which you which you mentioned earlier, uh, you recently interviewed uh, Dr. Shelley Spiller, who's a, a friend of mine. She's done a lot of great work on um, indigenous New Zealand leadership, and so um, I mean, you you alluded to this before about you know where the, the the direction of where the lessons can be imparted from business to government, and perhaps from indigenous people to business, rather than the stock standard orthodox other way round. So, so as someone who is a, a non-indigenous research researcher of indigenous research, what are the main things you've already come to understand about the value that this kind of indigenous research can contribute um, to our understanding of management strategy and, and so forth? Well, it's interesting. I'm writing an HBR potential article about the three things I've learned. Now, I do it with uh, indigenous uh, people. The current one is a medical, just recent medical doctor that traveled to, to Tokyo, Bangkok, and Hong Kong with me a couple of years ago on our hot cities trip. You know, she's a woman in her 40s with a couple of preteens. Um, worked for a while in the government uh, out west in healthcare, and so very sharp person that keeps us indigenously correct in the best sense of the word. But part of it, what am I learning? And, and a couple of lessons that strike me. One is there closer to community. There's a sense of community going back where they talk about their grandparents, their grandmothers particularly. So it's a sense of, of a smaller community, but not family, bigger than family. Um, nations often they say, but it's a matter of a few hundred or a thousand or two people. It's not, you know, 200,000, 300,000 Americans sort of thing. So there's a sense of, of the past is, is something to honor and appreciate. And they talk about seven generations principle. And they look forward to say, what is it that we're doing? And what is the impact four, five, six, seven generations from now when I'll be long gone? So there's this long community sense, a long-term view, both going back to the past and into the future, and a respect and engagement with creation in a way that um, you know big city people in North America and probably New Zealand, Australia, and so on don't have where we're not connected to nature, but they are very much connected to that. And that's something which, in a, an era of climate change, is probably our biggest problem in the world, seems to make sense for something to think about and learn from them. Yeah, and to me, it makes a hell of a lot of sense. And in fact, when I was working with, with, with Shelley um, some years ago now, I mean, I think one of the greatest lessons that she imparted to me and that, and that was imparted to me in, in, in participating in, in Indigenous research was that idea of stewardship over the environment. You know, mm -hmm. this, this idea that none of this matters when it comes to business unless the environment we're actually all embedded in is, you know, firing on all cylinders. And, and I think that does connect to the idea of climate change. You know, if we're not respectful guardians and stewards of the environment that we're living in, then business really doesn't mean a damn in the end, you know? Yeah, no, no, for sure. I mean, it's something where... Um you know, that seems to be the biggest problem that, that is out there these days. And given uh, kind of the truth of that, uh, there's a point saying, look, at these people have a sense of that we lack, and so we should learn from them. So I think that's something that we're wrestling with and uh, getting a, a greater sense for it. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. And now um, just to, to, to pivot to 
um, kind of the 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 main uh, central theme of this this particular podcast. Uh, the, the the focus of this podcast and my own practice is around ed- individual development in life and work. I mean, ultimately predicated on the idea that improvements in people lead to improvements in business. Um, and so I wonder if you had any thoughts on the role of people like me, professional coaches and leadership development professionals in the modern business landscape, perhaps where um, professionals like business coaches can be of most service to, to business practitioners. What, what role do we play um, in the modern business landscape? I think it's huge. I mean, I hear quite a few CEOs that they have coaches on their way to becoming the senior executives. Um, and I'm, I'm writing a book with a guy at Cornell, and it's based on a, a, a hockey or sports analogy that you go from playing college basketball to the NBA or from AHL to the NHL ice hockey, um, the game speeds up. And it's a different game. And Part of it is, so we're talking about in the corporate world, you go from superstar to manager, from a manager to a manager of managers to a C-suite to CEO. They're different games. You you do things, and the game is a different game. And so we've talked to a bunch of athletes about it, so it's kind of the entree of saying how the game is different. But saying is that it helps to have a coach when you go from being a superstar to a manager, because all of a sudden what you do is really a different set of tasks. And and it's a different game. And the end zone, that is how you define success as a different set of metrics. Your team, who you work with is different. How you manage upward and who you manage upward is different. So there's a lot of things which are quite different. And I think coaches, in a world of uncertainty, in a world of rapid change, having someone by your side who you don't work for but helps you and is knowledgeable and thoughtful is and it's talking to a lot of people, I think is extraordinarily more helpful today than 10 or 15 years ago would be my two cents worth. I appreciate that. And and, and, I mean, I think the the analogy with with sports is actually quite an apt one. And in fact, I I see a lot of the work I do as being sort of akin to the emotional and behavioral equivalent of a strength and conditioning coach. You know, like like Mm -hmm. a lot of the um, senior leaders that I've worked with as a coach are people who were um, expert technical managers in their own, you know, narrow, unique, particular domain and you know like the top of the food chain as far as their technical um, expertise is concerned but then they got the promotion into the c-suite where they needed to have better people better interpersonal skills higher emotional intelligence and so forth but because they'd been a technical manager for so long that was not a part of their um, managerial repertoire that was ever really brought out and so in a sense i think it's like a um, say a football player that's playing in in a bush league um, you know, at a bush league kind of level, they get advanced to a professional level, and then all of a sudden, their strength and conditioning requirements, um, you know, go through the roof, go up another level. And so, had bringing on a strength and conditioning coach can kind of help them to get to that, that next level. It's not a, it's not a uh, perfect metaphor. I think the analogy breaks down in, in a couple of places, but I think it's a fairly apt one. And I, I, I actually do really appreciate um, your analogy there with, with, with um, advancing in the world of sports as well. So um, just to finally uh, wrap things up here, um, is there any particularly notable piece of advice you'd give to any business school undergraduates, MBAs, executives, business school professors, anyone that's trying to be successful and happy and fulfilled um, in the current business zeitgeist? Well, two things strike me, uh, Gareth. One is... um Keep learning. And, and, you know, I'm amazed how many CEOs say say this in a way they didn't five or ten years ago. It's about learning. And some will give up being CEO to move to another opportunity if they're not learning. But it's a matter in today's world, it's changing so much. You've always got to be out there learning, finding what the latest thing is, being reverse mentored by Generation Z and so, is, uh, so on as part of it. So I think that pushing to learn. And the second thing is something we... I co-teach a class with a BCG partner, and he brings in a BCG partner every year who's from a company they bought a few years ago, which is about purpose. So I think this this topic of purpose is a big one out there, and kind of finding out what is your purpose and how does it fit in the context of the purpose of the organization. And it's not just about making money, it's about doing something 
useful in the world and something that, you know, hopefully it pays the bills, but something that uses your talents in a way which is, you know, not unique in the world, but it's just that Gareth Craze is just different than a lot of uh, the vast majority of people, and he should be Gareth and the strengths and abilities and occasional weaknesses that Gareth has, that he should bring something different to the world, which makes the world a bit better than it was or would be without him. Yeah, and I mean, sage words, I mean, I, th- I think fairly inarguable words. And I think I think if, if you're going to take the idea of authenticity and authentic leadership seriously, that has to be the mindset, right? I mean, there, there, there really has to be, a, 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 you know, you have to walk the talk. I mean, if, if, if authenticity is going to mean something, it has to be the warts and all version of you because the warts and all version of you is quite unlike the warts and all version of anyone else in the world, right? Absolutely. And so it's a matter, of, but this is something about the individual and purpose that just really is out there. And it's a hot, hot topic in North America and something that um, it's kind of a Z thing, a millennial thing. And it's something I think we've got to pay attention to as ourselves, but also for the people that we work with to help them get to where they should be and help them to find purpose in their being and what they bring to the world. Absolutely. And one, one thing I t- teach my Vietnamese students is, I mean, I, I would rather you, especially since um, they're all English as a second language students, I, I tell them, you know, I would rather you represent yourself imperfectly than mimic someone else perfectly. And, that, and that, 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 that's just something I try and impart as far as giving them the self-confidence just to express themselves and be themselves and, and, you know, and frankly set themselves up for success. Because as we know, you know, from, from what the research has been conducted on authentic leadership, it actually makes good business sense to be yourself. So it's, 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 it's not just that being yourself is a good thing in and of itself. There's actually a strong, strong business case for it as well. No, absolutely. And I think, you know, coaching like you do is very helpful in that process. Well, I hope so. Um, and uh, look, I think we're, we're, we're just about out of time and tape here. I just wanted to quickly ask, the, 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 the person you were working with at, at Cornell, that's not Kevin Niffen by chance, is it? No, Devin Bigginess. So, different Devin person. Biggins. Yeah. Okay, you know, Kevin. Kevin's a, a friend and colleague of mine at Cornell who's a big hockey fan, so I just kind of assume, and he, he plays on the hockey team there, so I assume you and him might have been naturally simpatico. But, um, uh, Carl, um always fascinating always always um great to hear from you and 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 always frankly exhausting because again as i mentioned at the top of the hour it always feels like you're doing 50 billion things at once and we can never quite get through all of them but uh it's it's actually legitimately tiring listening to you go through all the things you, you you do over the course of a given day but um but look it's been an absolute pleasure knowing you over this last decade or so and um absolutely thrilled to have had you on the podcast so thank you very much for making the time my pleasure. Always a pleasure to, uh, to chat, Gareth. Appreciate your ideas and energy and enthusiasms. All right. Cheers, Carl. We'll talk very, very soon. All right. Thanks, Take mate. Take care. Cheers.